four years fighting alongside historians, allies, other tribal leaders, other, other Wenatchee families for the return of the Wenatchee land back to the original people for rights to hunt, fish, gather, and honor sacred places as our ancestors have. It's an honor to have Matthew take care today. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, before I get started, I want to introduce you to a couple of people. I guess you guys got a picture of John Harmel. <coughs> That's John Harmel, the last chief of the one I choose. And this is his granddaughter. And his granddaughter was my mother. And she was raised by John Harmel. Well, her mother was so pregnant, her father left her for another woman. And her mother died when she was two years old, so John Harmel and his wife had to, had to raise her. And there are the two people that probably had the most influence on me being able to speak for before you today. May I leave those up? Can I leave those up? So sure. Please? Okay, you go ahead and sit. Yeah. Excuse me, because I had to sit down. I had a stroke about two years ago, and I can't get around very good. Do you need some water or no. anything? No. Thank you. But I, I mentioned my mother because when we were growing up, was, when I was about four years old, and my brother was about six years old, my mother started bringing us down to the Wenatchee country because that's where she was born and raised. And uh, she, she did that, I think, to help create an identity for our family, to let us know who we were, let us know, let us know where we was from. And, and it worked because we developed a very strong tie to that part of the country. And in doing all those things of bringing us down, or she told us stories about this guy, about how we become chief and some of the ways that people end up becoming chiefs. Because uh, there was a guy named Shmau that was chief during the 1855 treaty with the Acoma Indians. And uh, in our customs, the chieftainship usually passed down to the oldest son. Now, Chief Schumach didn't have an oldest son. He had a daughter. His daughter's name was Monique. Probably she got the name Monique from the non-Indian society because her Indian name sounded like Monique and they tried to name her so her name would sound just about the same if I seen it in the non-Indian way. So you heard me mention the 1855 treaty. I, I mentioned that because in in the 1840s, I guess it was, they started talking about rounding up all the Indian people and putting them on one reservation in the eastern and at, uh, Washington State. And so they, what they did is they did that, and they called it the Wall of Wall Treaty of 1855. And, uh, among those people that were grouped together was the Wenatchee Indians. During those, during that treaty, there was hit men from each one of the tribes, and as I mentioned, Chief Shumau was the chief of the Wenatchee people then, but he delegated a, a, a guy by the name of Tekolakan to represent the Wenatchee Indians at Walla Walla. And the 
call if I was supposed to go in there and tell them about the land they want to reserve for the one hatchings because the one hatchings didn't live that close to any other tribe. So the Kolak did, he went down there and, and when they finally arrived at, the negotiators finally arrived at an agreement, the night before that, all the Indians met together. And that's when the Kolakan told Chief Kamaik, and he was the chief spokesman for the Indians. He told Chief Kamaik that they wanted a six mile square area or, or a piece of land up by the one actually ice call. Uh, and so the next day when Chief Kamaik was finished negotiations, he told Governor, uh, Governor Stevens that he wanted that piece of land for the Wenatchee Indians. And so they put it in, a, I think it was Article 10 of the 1855 Treaty. They didn't mention Wenatchee Indian in Article 10. They, they just said a piece of ground for the aforesaid bands of Indians. Which, which really created great heartache for us today. If they would have said the Wenatchee Indians, it would have been a, a lot more clear, but they didn't do that. So uh, they said they were going to set it aside for them, and it was supposed to be the uh, President of the United States was supposed to direct when somebody would go up there and survey and set it apart from. Uh, the rest of the state of Washington. And the Wenatchee Indians just kept on living around their home country with the Icicle and Icicle Creek and uh, what they called Mission Creek then. And uh, they, they, they thought it was already agreed to them. They expected the government to keep their word about what they said. And in 1892, or, yeah, 1892, John Harmel was called down to the Yakima Reservation, a place called Fort Simcoe. That was an uh, agency down there, the Indian Agency. And so that was in December of 1893. And uh, he told my mother, the, Snow was up there, his horse's belly when he was riding down there. So the snow was pretty deep. And that's probably about, I would say, somewhere between 125, 150 miles from Mission Creek is where the mission is where John Armel lived. And he, he rode down there and got, got down there and he listened to what they were saying. And it, to him, it sounded like somebody was trying to sell the reservation. And it, and it come to me that the Indian agent was the one that was trying to talk them into selling the reservation, trying to talk the Yakima tribe into selling it because the United States decided that since it was the Yakima Treaty of 1855, the Yakima Indians must have owned it. So they went down there and tried to talk to the Yakima Indians about it. And during those negotiations, there was about five or six Yakima Indians that got up and told them, we can't go up there and throw my brother off that place and get rich off the land. We're, we're, we, you don't have to talk to us, you talk to those people over there. They pointed towards John Armel. I think there was three or four that went down with it. So they talked to John, John Armel, and he told them, told the Indian agent he didn't want to sell. And I, I, he said, I can't sell, let's go talk to my people first. And they kept on negotiating with the Yakima Indians, and the Yakima Indians refused to sell during that meeting. They refused to sell unless the one actually didn't even were taken care of. And so they adjourned that meeting without really 
arrive at a solution. And uh, they had to meet the next day. And John Rommel got up and told him as well. I heard you people talk, and I think I kind of like your words that you guys said. What I'm going to do, I'm going to go back and talk to my people about what you guys are talking about here, and then they'll decide what to do with that one action issue. So they kept on negotiating, and they adjourned that meeting, and John Hartnell left the Yakima Reservation and come back up to, the, up to where he lived. And uh, before he left, the agent, I think his name was John Lane, the Indian agent, told him that we're going to be up very shortly to talk to you guys about a lot in your land where you live, is what they told him. And John M. Help took that well, and I couldn't decide anything until they talked to the actually needs. So he went home feeling pretty pretty safe about that. And on uh, January 6th or 8th, one of the two, in 1894, they had another meeting down at the Afro Reservation. And during that meeting, they convinced the Yakimas that, well, we got those Wenatchee Indians satisfied, so you can go ahead and sell our property. You guys have never been there anyway. Don't even know where it's at. So, it, so it would be wise for you to sell it now instead of waiting for the Wenatchee Indians to decide something. So they, the, those five or six Yakima Indians kept on, kept on telling them that we can't sell it. That don't belong to us. And uh, they find, finally convinced the headmen there that that they were they were going to take care of the Wenatchee with a lot of land, and uh, that was supposed to be the same thing as the reservation was going to be was supposed to be six miles square. And so the Akma signed, I think it was 215 or 216 people, signed a petition to sell the land that we And uh, John Hamel was still sitting at home waiting for uh, Agent Lane to come up there and talk to the Natchez Indians about the state of his reservation. And they waited and waited and, and they never did come up there for about, I think, a year, I think, a year later. They came up there, and when they came up there, they had money, I think it was $9.30 or something like that. And they stuck it on a table like that and put it all in rows, $9.30. And they told the Indian, okay, come up and get it. That's your money. They didn't tell them what it was for. They just said, that's your money. So some of the Indians did get up and go get it. And then when they got it, they were told that, well, that's your share of the reservation that you guys saw. And that got John R. Milton Matt told him, I didn't sell that reservation. You're supposed to go up here and talk to us first. Let these people decide. I never did do that. Anyway, John Hermel refused to take the money. And because he said that agreement wasn't with him, the government started telling everybody that he refused the city of the reservation. And in refusing the city of the reservation, they were trying to say that he, he didn't, wasn't even trying to keep the resolution. But what they did is they, when they talked to him, they told him that we want to buy that piece of land that was surveyed up in the mountains from you guys. And John Hamel told him, I can't sell that to you. That don't belong to me. I can't steal from you guys. 
I can't sell land that don't belong to me. And they just kept on trying to talk to me and go, sell that. And because of that, he said he refused the resolution. But after, after that, in 1899 and 1900, he made two trips down to, uh, to Washington, D.C. Him and his uh, tribesmen sold some of their cattle that they had and, and bought him a train ticket to Washington, D.C. He was trying to straighten that out. And each time he had to bring an interpreter because he couldn't speak English. And he couldn't understand too much English. And he was trying to deal with the government people back in Washington, D.C. And I, and I was on a council. That was, last time I was on a council, it was 2000. I went back there to try to deal with the government people back there. I couldn't understand them a hundred years later. I had a loan John Armel trying to understand me. When he couldn't speak English, couldn't understand me. And there was a lot of things that they said he said that made it sound like he was refusing to even identify a resolution, refusing that he, he even had a resolution. But uh, He went on from 1901 up until 1935. He was trying over and over to get the government to recognize that they had a resolution down there. <coughs> tried several different ways. He even went to a, the mayor of Cashmere at that time. The mayor of Cashmere was a James Chase. And James Chase was pretty agreeable with him to the point to where he went to uh, James Chase and asked him to write a letter for him and send back to Washington D.C. and ask him about that resolution. And James Chase did just that, but then as soon as he done it, he started contacting all the people that was in the valley down there and told them, these Indians are trying to create a resolution down here in this valley and it'll really ruin our property value. It'll stop us from going across the roads and everything. We won't be able to do anything. And so all those people got a petition objecting to them even trying to get a resolution. And he always thought James Chase was a farmer. But he wrote two letters for John R. Melton. Each time he went behind his back did something like that. In fact, when my mother was growing up, she went to school in a place called Cashmore. Um, before that was called Mission. And uh, she went as far as the eighth grade in Cashmore. And she graduated eighth grade and she couldn't go to high school there. So James Chase offered to send her to Riverside, California to go to high school. And John Carmel told him, uh, I'm not going to send my daughter, daughter to my daughter down the house. I'm not going to go to her. So he refused to allow my mother to go to high school. So all she had was an eighth grade uh, education. Anyway, up until 1935, John Harmel was trying that, and uh, I think he was probably about 90 years old, about 1835, something like that, and his house burned up in Nohawk Canyon, and him and his wife were in there. And so my mother thought, there's never not a chance of us getting that reservation. I don't know if she had a premonition or whatever, but I think she was hoping that one of her sons would get into a position where they could help get that. And uh, it happened two years before 
I was elected to the tribal council. My nephew was elected. And when he was elected, I think it was in 1984, when he was elected, my mother had heard about a place, a, a thing called Indian Claims Court. I don't know when it ended. But uh, she tried to get my nephew to present the one action Indian's claims case to, to that court, and he wouldn't do it. And so two years later, I was elected, elected to that because of her efforts on bringing all of her children down to the Wenatchee Valley country and uh, creating the identity for them and their hope for that land on her. And that hope for that land got down and got strong enough to where when I was elected, I asked the business council if we could do something about it. And uh, about that time, there was an article in the one actually did a world that showed a picture of a bunch of Yakima Indians fishing down an ice over for That's at Leavenworth. And uh, I got mad about it. Got mad and told the council, I was that I'm going to go down fishing. So I did. That guy went with me. <laughs> We got in and went fishing. We was on a platform like that. And he caught a fish, and I was going to get it in one of those nets for him. So I didn't have to print it. Get it by the net, and I ended up falling in the river. But after that, the Yakimas stopped us, filed an injunction to stop us from fishing on it. So the federal court did stop and step in and stop us. And we told them that we would like to continue fishing her because, because we had a right with old Nazi Indians. And so we started our fishing case and on bad advice from some attorneys. I better step back a little bit. Uh, we, the call for tribe has been in a lot, a lot of suits over it, claims cases. And when you got those claims, everybody shared in those claims. It's all a reservation. Whenever we got a monetary settlement, we shared. And so when we did that fishing case, our attorney come and told us, well, you guys shared and everything else, you just walked share your fishing privilege with everybody on the reservation too. And they were telling me it was it was a slam dunk is what they told me. So we had a council meeting about it and the council decided that yes well go ahead and share we'll share that privilege. So we entered that court case like that. We went to Portland, Oregon or the Keys Federal District Court down there. And the court ruled against us. We come out of that courtroom before they ruled against us and we thought we won. And everybody is high five just all around the BL. About two weeks later they sent back an opinion that we're not you you can't go fishing in there because you were severing your ties with the Yakima Nation, they're the ones that hold the treaty rights to that place, not to call a fire. And one of the biggest fears is a court case because they spent so much time trying to figure out some kind of fish policy down on the Columbia that they thought 10,000 Caldwell Indians were going to be down at uh, Leavenworth Station, which, which we can't even get three Wenatchees down there now. I'm jumping ahead of myself. But anyway, we lost that case. We appealed it to the Ninth Circuit. And we lost that case. And so that injunction was still supposed to be all hanging over our heads that we couldn't fish. 
So I was trying to figure out what to do, and I got mad again. I said, this can't be happening. I'm going to go fishing anyway. So I went fishing again. Sure enough, the one actually filed, I mean, the Yakmas filed another injunction against me. And we went to court on that. And we lost that one. Holy smokes, now, now they really got us in court twice. That scared me. So I come back and I sat around as well. All the stories my mother told me when we were down in my Wenatchee country, there's no reason I thought we shouldn't have a right. So I got up and fishing again. Sure enough, we have to must file another jump. And this time they, they told the court that because of the prior growth on federal court case, they said the Wenatchees can't fish because they're not part of the Yakima tribe. And, uh, and that sort of opened the eyes of the appeals court. Because the appellate court said that, well, you didn't let them try to prove that. There's, has to be approved treaty rights. And that's difficult to do when you sever your ties with the uh, treaty rights holders, which is the Yakima tribe. And so we got to go, go to court again. And, they, and the Yakima's, the Yakima attorney filed a writ on Riz Judicata, I think it was called. And that's, that's saying that you can't come back in here and present the same evidence again that they ruled on. Ruled on. And the court told them that, no, we've got to hear the merits of the 1894 agreement, because that's what it was trying to get on, in on that time. We got to hear the merits, so we got to go to court on the merits. The 1894 case. And in the 1894 case, they presented all those statements from the Yakima Indians about that land belonged to the Wenatchee people. And finally, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals took, it, took it under advisement. They come back with an opinion saying that, yes, Wenatchee, you can go ahead and go fishing the same as. Uh, and so, after the fourth, the fourth time in court, we finally got a ruling that was favorable to us. And we were happy and happy because we thought it would open the door to us getting the reservation read. But nothing was mentioned about the reservation. The US uh, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals mentioned it in their opinion. And they said this isn't the last we heard of this case because according to all the evidence that was presented, these people are entitled to some land down in the Wenatchee area, which I thought was a good statement. I thought our lawyers would jump right on it, but nobody said anything. And so we come back went fishing, and ever since then, I've been trying to get our business council to do something about that reservation down there. And uh, not too much has happened since then. It's sort of like pushing a string. You ever try to push a string? You push a little bit, and that comes out this way. Push a little bit, it comes out this way. Every council since. 2010 has been the and you, you convince one of them, and they seem pretty gung ho about it, but then they go back and they talk to another one, and pretty soon they're not even listening to you anymore. And I know how frustrated John Hartwell got back when he was trying to do something because he couldn't speak anymore. He couldn't understand it. And I can. I have just about all the tools of 
of the Dharma Society now at my disposal. I still can do results. And uh, we presented a recommendation to them about a month ago, I think it was, that uh, about all the evidence that was, well, that was presented in the mission case that confirmed that we, had to, we were supposed to have a resolution done there. And we told them that we would like to use the same law firm that won the fishing case for us. And it went, it went to the council, a committee of the council, and the person that, that brought it to the committee's attention wouldn't even recommendation to go around for signatures. And it, it, it's sort of a good thing that he's playing because he has a friend in Washington, D.C. that they retained about maybe two or three years ago as their lobbyist, and he wants to use that for them. He's already sent them the information. In fact, a while back when they first retained that firm and other councilman asked me to send all this financial evidence to them in Washington, D.C., and they did, but nothing has ever, uh, ever happened. And this uh, lobbying firm has had the, all the evidence of a matter of money now, and nothing has happened. When our previous law firm was still here, <coughs> was still in charge of the mission case, we asked him to get us an audience with uh, Senator Murray and Senator Cantwell. A week later, we got a, we got a meeting with them. I think it was set for about two weeks later or something like that. He confirmed the meeting for us. And we did, we went back up that was Senator Murray and Senator Cantwell. And, uh, we got to meet with them, and we, at that time, we asked them about the reservation because we was meeting about the fishing rights case then. And they told us, well, if and when you guys win that fishing case, come back and see us. We'll help you. Well, we won it, and I went and told the council we won it. Nothing happened. So I don't know what's, what's going on there. It, it, it's really been a struggle to try to get the council to begin to, to continue doing something, I guess I should say, because for some reason, uh, maybe I'm bugging them too much because I'm in their ear about three times a week. I think she can testify to that because when she was on council. I was in the county chambers about three times a week trying to get something done, get something to do, do something, do something. And they told me, well, when we started that fishing case, they told me, they said, well, what are we going to do? Well, I would like to create a bunch of uh, positive publicity for us. And so they let me, let me hire a publicity for a PR firm. And we hired a lady that was, did a pretty, did pretty good job because she set a lot of dates for me to travel around the country. I presented that documentary that you guys saw on that false promise of documentary. She's, uh, she had got me doing that. And after the documentary was over, I stayed around and answered questions. In fact, when we first went down to Leavenworth and presented it was to the Rotary Club there. And uh, the, the, after it was over, they asked what we want. Well, we want the town, town of Leavenworth. I, I don't know, I'm just joking. Because I know what it's like for people to come in and take your land away from you. And that's what not, what not she's part about has taken land away from people that, that own it. We don't want any land that isn't owned that white people down here. Well, take 
client for the Prabhu Matamsa. Everybody knows. And we got a lot of positive public relations doing that. A lot of people wrote to send it to and said that you can offer us in relation to that just because of doing that document with Ghana. And uh, in fact, we showed it to her at uh, that art, art thing over here. I don't know what it is. Performance. Sh short there and uh, one of the people that work, worked here went to it. And he's become, become one of the biggest advocates for the one that she tried. And that David Lindegrad, and he called me about a month and he said, well, what's going on, Matthew? I said, boy, I'm really having a hard time even getting meeting with Senator Murray and can He said, well, why don't you just go to the president and ask the president to do an executive order for reservation? I said, well, I think if you did it, David, I think it would it, carry a lot more weight than me doing it, than just a tribal member doing it. So David did, he, he sent a letter to the president asking him to establish an executive order of reservation for the one actually tried. And currently, that's that's where we're at. And I brought Wendell along because I just got an email from him Tuesday, Wednesday, something like that, uh, about what he's been trying to do. It. And they refused to do that recommendation on hiring a law firm. I really got discouraged. I got really discouraged because I and I didn't really want to do anything. But Wendell's kept working on it. And he's been doing things like that. So I will, I'll let him explain that. Do you want to explain that one, though? Sure. First of all, is there any questions for what Matthew said? Or comments or anything? Yeah, you don't ask questions, I can't answer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he doesn't want to answer questions. Well, um, we had a philosophy that we wanted to to uh, pick the land that uh, we wouldn't disrupt, Matthew's already said this, we wouldn't disrupt the people that's living there. You know, when this, when the reservation was given to us, or was supposed to be given to us, they picked uh, land all over the place. They did about five or six surveys all the way up to Lake Wenatchee and uh, all around down to Wenatchee. And so when uh, the Colville tribe ceded all of Eastern Washington, one big uh, situation where we had to divide land up with the uh, Yakima tribe, and we got 50-some percent and they got uh, the other. During that testimony, uh, Vernon Ray, who's an anthropologist, Dr. Vernon Ray, uh, testified and uh, gave them a map that uh, that showed the uh, boundaries of the Menachee tribe during the Aboriginal times, all the way up until uh, the time of the treaty. And the map showed uh, from Lake Wenatchee all the way down to East Wenatchee, and the two ridges on both sides of the valleys. That was their land uh, that they uh, roamed in in the Aboriginal times. So what we're, I think what we're going to try to do, if we can get the committee to agree to this, is uh, we've been at trying to do this piecemeal and going to the Forest Service and saying, uh, you know, what land can you turn over to us? Because they, they got a lot of land there and they don't, they don't uh, uh, use a lot of that land. But unfortunately, a lot of that land that they have is forest land and it's on steep uh, cliffs, if you've been around that area, it's not really a usable piece of land. But they do have pieces of land that is usable. So we've concluded that we can't get a contiguous reservation like we have on the Colville or most reservations. 
you know, this is the boundary of the reservation. We're going to have to say, uh, we got this land over here and this land over here and this land over there, whatever we can negotiate to, to get as part of our reservation. And so all we have to do is constrain ourselves to what's inside that boundary that Dr. Ray defined. But there are a number of pieces of land that are ver would be very useful to our tribe. And uh, the one that I think is most useful right off the bat would be the fish hatchery down there. We've won our case on the fish, so we know that we have the rights to fish down there. We've got our own hatcheries. Uh, and we're, we're, we have a reputation now of, in the fish industry of really knowing how to run a hatchery, how to run a whole recovery program. We've got people all over the place doing everything like that. And uh, the federal government, if, if not um, the private people, but the federal government recognizes us that we are operationally capable of doing all this. So the plan would be to gradually phase into the operation of the fish hatchery. They have uh, 400 acres right there, isn't it, Matthew, for the, where the hatchery is? Something like that. Uh, and it's a developed area and uh, could be uh, used right off the bat. We've had powwows down there in the open area, several powwows over the years. They allow us to go down there and, and uh, perform the powwows. There is private land around that area that is for sale. Of course, it's very expensive, but if we go to the federal government and say, you know, this is part of what we want, which is the land that was supposedly going to be given to us, the federal government puts up the money and then we can buy that land. We've identified several pieces there that, that are uh, very desirable. As a matter of fact, just recently, last year, we, were, we had an ideal piece of land right on uh, Lake uh, uh, Wenatchee River, right up to Shasta. There was a land that was offered uh, to people. It was owned by the, well, actually the county and their development operation. They had picked up this land from the Pasasta Lumber Mill, at which they lumber mill shut down and they had to go in and environmentally clean up everything. So it took them several years to do that. And the land was uh, 40 some acres or 60 some acres, I can't remember which. 14 of it was right on, on uh, the river. Good fishing area. Well, we got preempted by all kinds of different organizations. Uh, the land, and as a matter of fact, <laughs> It's my assessment that as soon as we showed interest in it, uh, it created an interest for a lot of other people because that land had been offered for years and nobody moved on it. But like our tribe has done in the past, as soon as we show interest in something, then, then everybody else gets interested in it. Anyway, they, they have a, a fish group that has said they'd raise the money to buy the land. We'd actually offer to buy, the land, buy that land, uh, our council. Matthew said they hadn't done anything, but they were willing to do something, but we got preempted. This uh, fish outfit uh, come in and say, well, they signed a, an agreement. They said, we'll buy it, but they didn't have the money, of course. So we'll go get uh, contributions from people. So they've been doing this, and they're about, still about $140,000 short. And they had 18 months, and that's, I think, up this, this summer. And my hope is that they can't meet it. <laughs> if they can't meet it, then uh, we might be back in the picture. Because our council was willing to, to buy that 14 acres. That was good for the fishing part of it and whatever we wanted to do there. But uh, the land above that, which is adjacent to it, was all flat and developable. I mean, you could do anything you wanted. And everybody always kept saying, uh, you'd put in a casino. Well, we told them, you know, casino is not in our plans. We've got so many casinos now, we, you know, that that's, that's uh, not manageable. So 20-some years, uh, Matthew and I have been working on this, among other people. Uh, we always got hit with this 
you're going to do a casino. And this was back before we even had a casino up here, back in 1986, the first time we got started bingo here, and then eventually wound up uh, in a casino. But we went down there during that time, and uh, the, the pack that they have down there <laughs> was having trouble. They, they, uh, they, they couldn't get enough uh, plant programs in there to, uh, to justify the expense. They couldn't even keep the lights on. And we heard about that, so Matthew and I, and I think his, some of his relatives went with us, said, how about if we do a bingo thing right there in, in uh, your facility? That's all we're asking. We didn't, we didn't ask him to take over that facility. We're just saying do a bingo. Well, like I say, as soon as we did that, uh, it seemed to brought people out of the woodwork, saying, oh, that's just the first step to a casino. So they voted us down on that, and we weren't even able to get our foot in the door. But, and the same thing has happened to, uh, to this this uh, property that I was talking about, 40 acres above the, the fish area. We said, well, we don't want a casino, but we certainly could use it for a lot of other things. There's all kinds of other things to be uh, used there. Well, another party came in to buy that upper part, and they're going to do all kinds of things, like a, a winery, uh, recreation fields. Uh, they've got all kinds of big plans. And uh, Bob, I, I didn't get a chance to tell you, but Bob called me up a couple, few days ago and says, why don't you talk to those people? You could probably work some sort of activity in there. <laughs> yeah, sure, after the fact. We're looking for land to, for a reservation. We're not looking for activities at this point. Uh, so I, I don't think we're going to talk to those people about that sort of thing. But anyway, uh, that's kind of that part of it, but I still have hopes that their thing will fall through. But I've identified about a dozen pieces of land that would be useful for our tribe. Another history that I, that I didn't mention, and I don't think Matthew did either. Right down at the Monitor, there's a park there owned by the county, and right now it's just an RV park type thing. And in the past, they've had all kinds of problems, and I understand there's still problems with them. Uh, we, before that outfit started, we went down there and tried to uh, get them to uh, let us operate it. I don't think we were even talking about owning it then. We were just saying, unless we could operate it as an RV or whatever. <coughs> Again, we got crossfires with people that's Let's face it, and the union, you know, as soon as we mentioned uh, anything, they said, we're not going to let the Indians come in here. Uh, Wenatchee is probably one of the better places as far as relationships we have, but it's not good. <laughs> you know, there's still people there that come out of the woodwork. Unfortunately, most of our people have left Wenatchee. Uh, you know, we used to have a lot of people down here. Then. Yeah, I just wanted to um, interject uh, a couple things just for the students. Um, one of our, our topics this week is uh, political and economic structures of our tribe, and we've actually continued to um, bring up the different tribes throughout the seven weeks that we've, we've been uh, presenting so far. Um, we've we've, we've uh, covered history from uh, pre-contact uh, early colonization, first encounters, and, and uh, forced assimilation, relocation from our Aboriginal territories. And so right now, what we're dealing with is more contemporary um, political structures. So what I wanted to share with you, which, we did, which I didn't announce earlier, and I apologize, but Matthew and Wendell both represent um, not only elders, but um, you know, former tribal leaders, policymakers, and uh, diplomats. Uh, they represent Wenatchee people and their families on an advisory committee. It is an actual advisory board. Not all of the 12 tribes that, can, that are part of the Confederation have an advisory board of representatives, spokespeople from that tribe. 
the Wenatchees do, and actually they were like the first tribe to actually have an advisory board to the council. Part, remember when we talked about when did the Wenatchees become part of the confederation? Were they one of the early tribes, or were they one of the later tribes? They were one of the later tribes. And when that happened, um, there has a lot of the families, ma many, I shouldn't say a lot, because actually there was only a few, few of the families, um, when it came to relocation, did not leave their homesteads, did not leave their areas, and uh, Chief Harmel and his family did not. My grandmother's family did not. Uh, my grandma, um, Agnes Wistockin, went to Kashmir school as well, and uh, she didn't um, join the Kalba Reservation until you know, she was almost married, you know, so she was a young lady. But her, she also lived with her grandparents. Um, so probably the Wenatchee um, people have a stronger connection to that to their land from their their families from their stories maybe than 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 other tribes. I don't maybe maybe not maybe that's a misquote. But what I do know is there's no there hasn't been a tribe in the Confederation that has fought as hard to reclaim something that actually legally um, is in their in, in the court of the Wenatchees. I mean, they should be able to have a reservation of land according to uh, the legal briefs, according to um, the, if you when you watch the false promises, when you read some of the texts, you. You're going through and you're wondering what the heck happened. You both ended, uh, ended up becoming um, scholars on behalf of your families, on behalf of our families. And, you know, my hat is off to you. But I wanted the students to know that we, part of bringing our different tribal reps in and hearing their history, hearing their, their, their uh, where, where, they, where they began, the, the relocation issues, the relocation issues, we always have to re recall that there's always an economic reason why these tribes have been moved from certain territories. Because somebody's economic gain is not, has not been the, the, the economic gain of our tribes, right? So it's a, more of a Western economic gain. So I just want to um, say that, that uh, the Wenatchee tribe is very unique by having this advisory board. They're speaking on behalf of their advisory board, on behalf of their families, on behalf of tribal lead, ex former tribal leaders. Um, they've done more in diplomacy, working with the other municipalities um, and other government uh, representatives down in the Wenatchee area in the state, statewide, and now you know nationally. Um, you know, this is a political event. And I think that it's very important that we say that. It's, it's very political. The other piece of it is a lot, if you, if when you're reading and you're studying on the Wenatchees, you really understand that uh, there's a lot of fear about our people uh, going, returning back into that area based on contemporary stereotyping and prejudice and discrimination. And Wendell hit on it by saying that, I mean, if I had to hear somebody say again or read in the paper or meet some public person speaking out or hearing from the community, well, if those Indians come, they're bringing casinos and smoke shops because that's how they make their money. You know, I mean, that's a stereotype. And, um, and we all know that, um, you know, right now, you know, we're, you're, we have, my daughter lives in Leavenworth. She has land in Le outside of Leavenworth. And she's a, she's a manager of the uh, clinical ICU unit, uh, cardiac ICU unit in Central Valley Hospital down in Wenatchee. And we have a number of family members that are still there, but they, they, they don't know. We don't know about it. And we're not working, you know, together to understand all this. My grandkids go to, go, have went to school at Kashmir and at Leavenworth, and the, none of them, none of their teachers believed that there was ever such a thing as Indian people being down there. So, I mean, they have to be the tokens to kind of help 
constantly move this history forward, or at least make you know, bring to public awareness that you know this is Wenatchee territory, and there's a long history here. So my hat is off to both of you, and I and bring it up the point of where we're at right now. It's really important that we hear this because I, as students and as um, uh, activists, social justice folks you becoming aware of this, we hope that the stories continue to be shared you know, with facts. Remember, the philosophy of this class is, I'm not the expert. The experts come from our elders and the people who have lived and carry on the stories. So I mean, today again, here we have, we get to witness this. So thank you for letting me interject, but I wanted to make sure that they understood where the Wenatchee and the advisory board and the relationship to council and, and the relationship with other government. Okay, uh, I just want a few more things to point out. Uh, Wenatchee, uh, we tried to identify how many Wenatchees we have in our, on the Caldwell Reservation, and it's really difficult because of the intermarriage at this point. And uh, as a matter of fact, you'll find all of us have multiple tribes in our, in our uh, background. But the Wenatchee speaking tribes of the Salish language is uh, the Sin Cayuse, which is Moses Columbia, the Chelan, and the uh, Wenatchees, and the Inia. They were the first confederation created. This was before the reservation. It was created in the early 1800s. They created that. They used to go down to Wenatchee and have uh, celebrations. They would get together there at least once a year. And the other thing they would do is go to uh, Montana and hunt buffalo. And uh, that was uh, a, just an annual event for, uh, well actually the hunting buffalo was more than annual because they wind up staying over uh, two years over there. But uh, And, and uh, Chief Moses is uh, uh, Dad was killed uh, fighting the Blackfeet because uh, they didn't like us taking their buffalo. As a matter of fact, it wasn't just a buffalo. Uh, we also stole their women, so that was a little more uh, closer to home. But uh, that, they came over and stole ours too, so it was an even thing. It's called diversity, right? <laughs> Anyway, what I wanted to say is Matthew and I were very close uh, in our history, too, because my, uh, when I was here a few weeks ago, I told about my grandfather, Lahome. He was with Telcoquin Tel uh, at the 1855 treaty. I think Telcoquin was quite a bit older than him, but he still was young, probably in his 20s, which is old back in those days. But my grandfather was only about 15. And he went down because his dad, uh, Joko Sass, was too old to travel that far. He several days riding uh, horseback get down there. And he wasn't able to, to ride that far, so the hope went down with him. And they were actually there those several weeks of, of the treaty negotiation. And uh, they were the ones responsible for getting this Article 10, which said that the one actually has had this, should have this uh, reservation. So that's where it all started. And uh, to continue a little bit about what I was saying, what we're trying to, to identify, which should be in part of the reservation, is the state park at, uh, at uh, Lake Wenatchee is, uh, is a good facility for actually uh, doing activities if our tribe was to, uh, to have that land. The state could easily turn it over to us. There might be money involved, but it's, Congress has a lot of money, right? <laughs> the Shasta Pinnacles, well, I think, is one that they would turn over to us uh, immediately because uh, there's really nothing there to, for, for them to sacrifice. But there is a lot there for, from our viewpoint because it's a spiritual thing. Uh, the Spirit uh, Pentacles has stories about it that, that uh, reflect our culture. And it's not a very big, it's 32 acres or so. And 
It's on the side hill, it's out of the way, nobody can bother it, there's road goes right by it. It wouldn't be a, a money maker for us, but it would be something we could call our own and something we could actually uh, do something with. And uh, Monitor Park would be one we could operate very quickly. I don't know what the acreage of that is, but it's big enough that it would be some sort of revenue. Uh, the county could turn that over, and like I said, they're in trouble with that for some reason. I don't know all the details. There's some land that's uh, up for sale, right? If you're familiar with Wenatchee, where the rivers, Riverfront Park is, during, during, uh, around the Columbia River, right below uh, Wenatchee Avenue. There's some land that's for sale there, and again, it's expensive, but it's it could be developed in a not casinos or smoke shops, but or possibly on the side. But one thing that's been suggested was uh, was uh, like our uh, gas station that we have out on the highway here. It, it, that has been very uh, rewarding and, and profitable. And we're talking about one at Manson and one at Moses Lake. This would be a good spot for, for that. And so, so just a few of those things that generated money would, would uh, make our tribe viable. Uh, other areas that could be picked out, which are uh, private land, and you could say, okay, that's within the boundaries of the reservation, but we'd negotiate with these people, and if they wanted to sell it, fine. If they didn't want to sell it, fine. You know, so we could go through all this. We're talking about uh, six miles square <laughs> reservation which is 20 some thousand acres. So we may have to trade off if we have something like the fish hatchery, which is worth a lot of money on its own, the assets of the, whatever, uh, however you evaluate it. We might have to trade off our, our acreage for something that's valuable like that, but, but uh, I don't know. I'm just guessing that might be what the negotiation would be. But anyway, there's at least a dozen sites there. And there, there's also, Matthew has identified uh, uh, private uh, uh, inherited land, which is, I guess, belongs to a lot of different tribal members, but there's land spotted all over around the Kashmir area that uh, I guess if, if they, if those, and they're not using that, but the tribal, their descendants, so that <laughs> it's a mile long, the people that's, that owns it now. But you can consolidate the ownership and make that part of the reservation. So there's all kinds of things that can be done, and it's going to take years to do all that. So what I was telling Matthew is that we ought to say, this is our plan, and we don't do it today, but we, our plan is to develop it over a number of years. What we have to do, though, is get Congress to say, yes, that's your land, and have them behind us with their, with their capability of with the power for them to say, that's your reservation, and the power for them to come in and buy the land if we have to buy it, and the power for, to tell the Forest Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service, turn that over to them for the tribe. The Congress is the one that can do this. And uh, so that's what we're going to try to do. Uh, yeah. so, it, 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 so. it's, re it's really hard to try to figure out why we have to go back to Congress to get this reservation because it's been through Congress twice and it's been ratified by the President of the United States twice. I mean, it should be our, our U.S. Senate Park, and they still haven't done it. And that's what we're trying to get them to realize that, that it's already been ratified by the president twice. And uh, we keep going back to that call for business council and tell them that. But it just doesn't ring any bells. Another thing I wanted to mention while I got your attention, when we first uh, organized it, I had reported that Lynn was talking about the Wenatchee Advisory Board. We had a had a big meeting of most of the Wenatchee people on the reservation. In fact, Lynn's dad was at it. And uh, 
we we had the meeting, we elected the officers to be on that advisory board, and I was elected to be chairman. My brother was elected to be vice chairman. And so we after that we was running down to Wenatchee about three times a week, and he's two years older than me. He was. We was going down there one day and he says, Boy, well, look at those other tribes, the Palouse tribe, Warnersburg tribe, the Nesbury tribe. As soon as the treaty was signed, they all went to war with the United States. Says, Hill William, let's declare war in the United States and maybe we'll get something. So we start talking about it. One way to get something is by going to war with them. But then we then we start joking around well. What if we don't get anything done and we die? Nah, we're not going to die right away anyway. We didn't think it, think it would take us 30 years to try to get something done. And he died three years ago. So I, I went and told the council, well, I don't know how long I have to live. I'd like to see something getting something done before I die anyway. And that's what my mother thought about when she was still alive. John Armel tried for 50 years to get something done, he wasn't able to do it. And my mother spent the next 60 years just instilling that pride in her children to try to get something done. And she died. So there's been at least four generations now that have been trying to get something done. And uh, right now, the biggest fight we have is with our own leaders here on the Caldwell Tribe. And I can understand they're probably all Republic and they're pretty conservative. They're scared to do anything. No. <laughs> oh, excuse me, Wendell, that's right. You're Republican. I have a question. Well, um, we're reading this book. And this book says that the Wenatchees, Moses, Columbia, um, Antia, Chelan, we weren't part of the tribes that was uh, put on this reservation. How did we become a part of this reservation? Oh, there's, <laughs> they said all, all tribes, uh, all people that, actually they gave, uh, in the Wenatchee area, they gave them a choice. And the Schlen people made some good choices. They, they picked land around Manson. Excellent choice. But they, they said they, they could have the land, you know, to live on, or they had to go to the reservation. That was their only choices. My great-grandfather, Choco Sass, decided to stay in India. He never left. But his son, my grandfather, came up here. But they were ordered to. That was sometime after 1872 when uh, this reservation was created. They were ordered to, uh, and actually forced. <laughs> there was there was no in, choice. In, in 1902, after John Harmel's trip back to Washington D.C., the federal government appropriated five thousand dollars to relocate Wenatchee Indians up to the Colville Reservation. And this was after being told that they're part of the Yakima Reservation, the Yakima Nation. And they put them on the Caldwell Reservation, made them a part of the Confederation up here. And that was one of the arguments that was presented in the court that they're not even a tribe anymore, they're part of, part of the Caldwell tribe. And so we had to argue that point, finally establish that because we have an advisory board because we do all our cultural things here, we're still a tribe. And we won the argument, by the way. Mm -hmm. And another thing, too, while we was growing up, and our mother was telling us all these stories about uh, the Treaty of 1855, about all the battles that John Armel had done. And uh, after our third loss in court recently, we hired a historian to do research on the history of the Wenatchee tribe. And so he did, he went by his pretty thorough. And while he was doing that research, we presented to the court 
It was everything my mother told us as was growing up, everything. The only thing that she didn't have right was about the surveys because she didn't know anything about surveys. But she told us everything else about where uh, the 1855 treaty, where the reservation is supposed to be. So I really believe that she gained a lot of that knowledge and wisdom from her grandmother, grandfather and wanted to pass it on to her children. And she did. She was able to do that because our whole family is pretty involved in this pretty involved in the cultural aspects of the Wenatchee tribe. As far as, like, like I said to, today, we're uh, trying to convince the Caldwell Business Council. Does the Business Council not have an interest in trying to help or? Well, it, it's sort of like lip service. They'll tell us when we're in front of them that we're trying to help us. And once we go in, nothing happens. We've got to go back in front of them again, and they'll tell us again they want to help us. I think they believe in the case, because I was asked by one council person to please bring her the evidence that I'm talking about, because I talked about the 1855 treaty that uh, I have a secretary there recording all the events in the 1855 treaty. And he recorded the meeting that the Indians had the night before they uh, finished the negotiations. And that was when all the Indians met in Tacolac and told them that he wanted that piece of land. That was recorded. So all that evidence occurred and I never gave all that evidence to that council person that wanted to see it. I don't know if they read it to him. I gave him that documentary. I don't know if they watched that either. I know you've been fighting this for years and for years I've been just curious why is it council doesn't step up and even bother to try to help you guys because of the fact that we we are part of this tribe and we were put there put here one, 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 one thing that we've been doing wrong is that when we fought that fishing case, it was very expensive, really expensive, because we had to hire those, that uh, law firm from Washington, D.C., the historian, and things like that. And it, and it got really expensive, and it was a, on the tribe's dollar. One thing that we should have done was uh, uh, sued for attorney's fees anyway. If, if we won, we get our attorney's fees paid. Mm -hmm. If we lost, we have to pay them. But we could do the same thing with this case. If we win this case, I think we could sue for attorney's fees at least. And the other thing I wonder was talking about buying a piece of land here and here and here. I've always been of the mind that they were supposed to give us 23,000 acres back in 1855, never did, yeah. and ever since oh, about 1900 or something like that, they've had none in the development of land, yeah. the development, and in those 116 years now, how many billions of dollars have they made off that land that was supposed to go to us that the Wenatchee Indians could have developed it? and done the same thing. Yeah. So when we talk about getting a piece of land here and here, it shouldn't be 23,000 acres. It should be something like 500,000 acres because they just owe us interest on that. Right. Because we could have developed that land. We could have been making money on that. Right. I agree. So is there any other questions for Matthew? We're getting to the end here. Any specific questions? Who all has fishing rights at Icicle? Pardon? Who all has fishing rights at Icicle now? Uh, as far as I know, the Akama tribe and the Wenatchees. Yes, correct. Wendell, is, is there any other questions for Wendell as well? 
have a question for both of you. So, is there any young people in your family that are stepping up to take this battle on? I have two daughters that religiously attend the Wenatchee Advisory Board in board meetings that we have once a month. I don't know whether they have the diligence to work 30 years like we've, had, we've done. No, I don't know if that's going to happen. Hopefully it won't take 30 years. Hopefully it will end pretty soon. But yes, I, I do have family members of well, my kids all live off the reservation, so they're not heavily involved in any of this. You know, I try to keep them the prize of it, but it's difficult when they live off the reservation. Just um, in closing, uh, a lot of the frustration for that Matthew has been talking about, and I'm not putting words in your mouth, Matthew, I'm trying to um, make sense of the 30 years of fight for the Wenatchee uh, territory and for the rights of the Wenatchee people um, haven't always been on deaf ears with the council. There's been councils that have been up and down, up and down, depending, as many of the former council would say, depending on how many Wenatchee sat around the table. because. The issue is you have a legislative body of 14 members and the political structure, the elected legislative body of those 14 members, seven of them are up every year. Okay, so the political structure is a challenge in itself. So when you're trying to, um, my time on council that I was warned before I was there was the fact that the political structure doesn't allow you to make much gain. You know, you have to have a real good, a, it's almost unlikely, but if you're lucky to be able to have a team of leaders where you can prioritize goals and create long-term goals and work towards those goals, um, it's nice if you could do it within one year, but maybe that next year, sure in the heck doesn't happen. <laughs> and so then the people change, and so the instability of that of our constitution, the way our elected people are set up, that actually has hindered these kind of um, issues. And I so I look at it as the way the political structure is set up for decision making, make prioritizing uh, issues and projects and policies to um, the makeup of of our of our um, council as well. It used to be when they, when the original council, when they were elected, they were looked at as we want to have representatives from all of the tribes. And the districts were kind of set up in a way that the different tribes um, could, were in these different districts. Now, with all the intermarriages and everything, and people are off, the, each of the four districts there's not one tribe that um, is the majority in, the, in a certain district anymore. And the, the people also, they don't vote like a democratic process where we come home and vote. We have a, we have a democratic process because our most majority of our people live off the reservation. And so they we have an absentee. And so we, they can be voting wherever they want. And most of the time it's for their family, maybe who might be running. <laughs> they'll, they'll claim a district for depending on who runs. So it's frustrating and, and, and we're trying to find logic in our brains about this is important. This is a tribe. This is a territory that a people, why is this council not doing it? Well, the truth is it's, it's the structure sometimes it's just not set up. Remember, not everybody is Wenatchee and, not, and it is not, may not be the priorities of the time. But as um, I call myself a novice as a young council person on the, and, and young meeting, I haven't been there as long, but we should have a process that we are able to prioritize issues that are going to have long-term impacts 
and this Wenatchee Reservation could have a long-term impact because of the fishing and the hunting and the gathering and the sacred sites. You can't drive up and down Wenatchee and not know of a story of a particular place in the river the the uh, different places are named after our people and our tribes. So I mean, there's just so much history there. So um, it, it's unfortunate, but you know, thank you for bringing it to life again. Um, all I can say is, I as a descendant, say. I would like you to please let us know, let me know if there's anything that I can ever do to help. Um, Matthew, I have just a little tiny token gift for you. So please take this and know that you know we appreciated your time and I hope to have you all back again. Um, we maybe on a panel and talk. So you know we're we're trying to figure out how we're going to do that. We have three more weeks and um, we definitely will do that. But we are getting into contemporary times and the contemporary challenge is the way the political structure is set up and and how do we prioritize uh, policies? How do we prioritize? Um, long-term projects that can have a not only a historical impact but impact for our future generations so yeah. thank you for being the fighters and the warriors that you are so yeah, does the, that the, mean the, he's, he's talking sorry you get an idea of the interaction between the council members on the council even though they're not from the same tribe or her, have blood in your tribe that's the way when when and i have been working and and when you get on a council, they have, like Lynn said, you're seven elected every year. Every year they have reorganization. And reorganization means they're going to elect a chairman, vice chairman, chairman of the committees. Uh, every year right after reorganization, I go to the council and give them the same kind of update that I just gave you. I do that, but before I do that, I tell them that you have the constitutional duty to look after the rights of the Wenatchee people. And this is what the Wenatchee people are asking you to do. Because when we have advisory board meetings, that's what comes out. That's what the Wenatchee people want them to do about their rights. You would think after 30 years that council would have been able to have helped out though. Because that's a long time to fight for something that's originally part, like you're saying, all of us are spread out across the reservation of blood has gone through the threads. It seems like council should be now in there for all tribes. I, th I, I really think they tried to be. And they really got their hands tied because of the budget every year. They, they have one dollar, but they've got to spend a dollar and a half to spend that dollar. So they end up 50 cents behind every year. And uh, every year we're trying to, like Lynn said, prioritize what the council should be doing. And if you're not there hollering at them, you're not going to get priority. That's why I go there every year. So, what kind of what, what kind of things would you guys need like to like for support from the people? I think for the Omak people, I think the Omak people need to start calling the Omak council people, telling them that this Wenatchee land issue is going to want, be one of the biggest economic gains that the Caldwell tribe ever had. It'll even surpass the Grand Cody Dam's place. Do they have, you their, have, uh, to do they have their numbers, phone numbers, or email numbers? I know them. They're my cousins. <laughs> <laughs> Cultural, historical, and economic. We have Wenatchee Indians in council right now. The the Marchands are both um, <laughs> John Cleveland's grandkids. Getting me all, all getting me all mad. No, I'm teasing. Um, yeah, I think it's it's time to go ahead and close up because the students have their time that they have to get finished okay. up here. But in uh, other words, quit talking. No, in <laughs> other words, yeah. we're going to invite you back. You, Lynn, you Wendell said the same that. thing. Well, Wendell said the same thing to me. What's that like? All right, Lynn. I'm happy. We're okay. But can you get her to be quiet? <laughs>
She does not. But, but once you get a politician talking, they don't quit. That's right. <laughs> but it's good. This is great. It's great. Give them a big hand, guys. But I would like you to, before you leave, those get a picture of you and Wendell when you guys are here together. And with the students. So why don't you students come up here and <laughs> let's.